سورة المباركة الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع المذنبين وخاتم النبيين نبينا وشفينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا بالقاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صلي على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإليك يا رب نسبت وجهي وإليك يا رب مددت يدي فبعزتك استجب لدعائي وبلغني مناية ولا تقطع من فضلك رجائي واكفني شر الجن والإنس من عدائي يا سريع الرضا اغفر لمن لا يملك إلا الدعاء فإنك فعال لما تشاء يا من اسمه دواء وذكره شفاء وطاعته غنى ارحم من رعى سماله الرجاء وسلاؤه البقاء يا صابغ النعام يا دافع النقام يا نور المستوحشين في الظلم يا عالم لا يعلم صل على محمد وآل محمد وافعل بي ما انت اهل وصلى الله على رسوله والعيمة الميامين من آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وهو أستق الصادقين وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالسابر آمنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات الله محمد وآل محمد <تصفيق> Elders of the community, my brothers and sisters in Islam, Salaamun Alaikum, Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. A'adhamu Allahu ujurana wa ujurakum bi musabina bi Aba Abdillah al-Husayn alayhi salatu wa salam. As we prayed the tribute last night to Janabi Zainab Salaamullahi alayha, we outlined some of the pristine qualities of this lady, this lady of life, the princess of Islam. And amongst many of her qualities, <coughs> one of the qualities that truly exemplifies the word Zainab, whenever you hear her words, whenever you hear her personality, whenever you hear her name, one particular quality comes to mind and faces you, and you understand that she was the epitome and the essence of this particular quality and character, which is highly recommended in Islam. And that is the quality of sabr, the quality of patience. You see, we have a life of comfort. Sometimes we have a life where we have a good house, a good car, a good job, good children. And then all of a sudden, a calamity befalls us. Something happens. And what happens sometimes is a calamity become, befalls us. And as we have, you know, as we are in the process of dealing with that calamity, and as soon as that finishes, something else happens on us. 
And as soon as that finishes, something else happens to us. And when that happens, consecutively especially, it shakes our faith. It shakes the faith of the believer. And the believer immediately says, why me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not find anybody else in this whole world. I'm a good person. I come to the mosque, I recite my prayers, I fast in the holy month of Ramadan, I've even gone to Hajj, I've even gone for ziyarah, I pay my khums on time. Why me? And immediately what we do is we, invo we get involved in this culture of blame. We start to blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or we blame shaitan. This is the culture of blame that we have. You know, in um, Swahili, you know, we used to say, Nimejaliwa, you know. In Africa, we used to say, Nimejaliwa, you know, it was, it was destined for me. Or in Gujarati, we say, Nasib malake luhat. Right? And it is this immediate culture of blame that we say, oh, Allah has done this to me. And then we say, why me? Is there really a God? Does he really exist? One thing after another, a calamity has befallen us. But when you read the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ista'inu bis sabri was salat, inna allaha ma'as sabirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh you who believe, seek assistance through patience and through prayer. Surely Allah is with those who are patient. There's a confidence in this ayah that Allah is saying. Surely Allah is with those who are patient. Then he says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَا وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do not speak of those who are slain in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being dead. No, they are alive, but it is you who do not perceive. And then Allah moves forward and says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُعْ وَنَقْزٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, we will most certainly test you. We will most certainly try you with fear. We will test you with fear. We will test you with hunger. We will test you with the loss of your property. We will test you with the loss of your lives. We will even test you with your children. But then he says, but give good news. Good news to who? O oh Allah. Give good news to those who are patient, to those who have sabr. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines those people. Who are those people, or Allah, who have sabr? They are those people, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَسَابَتْهُمْ مُسِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They are those people who, when a misfortune befalls them, they say, surely we are from Allah and to Him we shall return. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves forward. You see, we stop here many times because this is a very famous ayah, right? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So this is where we stop. But there is a very important ayah right after that because Allah goes forward and He explains more. Ula'ika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahma wa ula'ika humul muhtadun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are those people who when a misfortune befalls them, they say that we are from Allah and to him we shall return. These are those people who bear patience and have sabr. And these are those people on whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have my special blessings and mercy on these are those people who have special blessings and mercy from their Lord. And they are the people who are the followers of the right course. 
Here you see clearly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you. Why does he test you? So that he can make you deserving of his special gifts and his special mercy that he has. That is why he tests you. He tests you so that you may develop yourself, so that you may blossom and be worthy of his special gifts and his special blessings. See, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, you know, he says that you think that you can just sit there and sometimes you just think you can sit there and Allah will just give you his blessings. You think that you have nothing to do, just sit there and maybe, you know, raise your hands and say, oh Allah, just give me your blessings and give me your mercy. That's not the way Allah works. The way Allah works is when you do dua that, oh Allah, give me your special blessings and give me your mercy, Allah then gives you an opportunity for you to develop and blossom in such a way that you become deserving of his special blessings and mercy. And that you can only do by doing sabr. And this is what the sixth Imam has said in a hadith. The sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salam wa alayhi. He says that do not think that the calamities are for God to determine how faithful you are to him. Sometimes we think that Allah tests us because he wants to see how much faith do you have. How much faith do you have? Allah wants to see. The sixth imam says, do not think that Allah, you know, that when a calamity befalls you, it is because Allah wants to test you to see how much faith you have. Allah knows how much faith you have. He is ilm. He knows how much faith you have. Allah tests you because he wants to determine, he wants to see, he wants to make you worthy of his special blessings and his special mercy. See, we tend to quantify blessings, right? Especially in our communities, right? We want to quantify blessings. How many of this? How much of that? Right? How many of my properties? How much of my health? This is how we tend to quantify. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not quantify the blessings that I've given you. The blessings are not there to be quantified. Look at the quality of the blessings that I've given you. If I have taken something away from you, I may have in return given you a heart that yearns for me. And the quality of that blessing is much higher than the quantity that you have in your mind of what I have taken away from you. It's very interesting because, you know, if you look at the example of sabr from the Quranic perspective, then the pristine example of sabr from Quran is the sabr of Prophet Ayyub, right? Prophet Ayyub was that prophet that had incredible sabr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember what I said, right? Allah said in that holy Quran that if you do sabr, then you will make yourself worthy to be deserving of my special blessings and mercy. And this is the concept that Ayyub knew. And shaitan comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says to Allah, you know your prophet Ayyub, you know why he does your shukr. Because Ayyub was known as that prophet who always used to show gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who always used to do the shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who always used to be thankful towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shaitan says, the reason that Ayyub is doing that is because of the blessings you've given him. If you were to take away those blessings, then he would not be grateful to you. So he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at the fact that he has all this wealth with him. He has all this property with him. Because if he has, because he has that, that is why he is thankful to you. If you were to take that away, he would not be thankful. So Allah takes away 
the property and the wealth of Ayyub. And what does Ayyub do in return? He becomes more thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And shaitan comes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, no, 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 no. The reason he is more thankful to you is that although you have taken his property and his wealth, he still has his children with him. He still has his own house with him. And he knows that with, his, with, the, with the help of his children and his house, he will rebuild what you have taken from him. That's why he is thankful to you. So Allah takes away his children and he takes away his house. A man comes to Prophet Ayyub and he says that your children were eating dinner and the roof of your house collapsed and all your children died. And what was the response of Ayyub? He becomes even more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He becomes even more thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then shaitan comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, no, no. The reason why he is thankful to you, more thankful to you now, is because you have left him with his own health. And you have left him with his strength. And he knows that with his own health and with his own strength and his own courage, he will be able to rebuild everything that you've taken away from him. And Allah takes away the health of Ayub. And what is the response of Ayyub? He becomes even more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? He becomes more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because having taken all of these things away from, from him, Allah gave Ayyub the ability to have shukr towards him. To be able to yearn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be able to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the concept of sabr, my friends. The concept of sabr is just that. The important issue sometimes for us is not that calamity that befalls us. It's not that misfortune that befalls us. It is our perception of that calamity that befalls us. We look at something that happens to us and we immediately compare ourselves with other people. We say, look at me, I had all of this and Allah took it away from me. And look at this other person, he is such a bad person. He is so evil, he doesn't do anything, he's not even a Muslim. And Allah has showered him with so many blessings. It's not the calamity, it is our perception of the calamity that causes the problem within us. And we don't understand the fact that in doing so, Allah is giving you an opportunity to develop, to perfect yourself, perfect yourself in such a way that you become deserving of his special mercy. We have always seen sabr as a sign of weakness. We have always seen sabr in light of negativity. We have always seen sabr, you know, we see it you know, bichara sabar kare se, you know, bichara sabar kar raha hai, you know, we say, you know, majboor, hopelessness, that is how we have seen sabar, but we have not realized that sabar is that faculty, that character within yourself that gives you the power of resistance. It develops you, you see, when you fast in the holy month of Ramadan, and boy, I got to tell you, man, I take my hat off to you guys in Edmonton because your fasts are 20 hours sometimes. But when you do that fast and you're not eating and drinking, what happens to you? You create that power of resistance within you. It is sabr that is the key to the purification of your nafs. It is that sabr that will take you away from that slumbering consciousness that we talked about yesterday. It's a faculty that comes from the heart. And the best example of sabr that I can give you from the hadith is that example of Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And you've heard this story a hundred times, I'm sure. And it is the story of Khandak, right? When Ali ibn Abi Talib is fighting Amr bin Abdawad. Amr bin Abdawad, he was a warrior of that time. Eh? Not an ordinary man. He was one of the bravest 
people of that time that when people used to hear the name of Amr ibn Abdawad, they would start to shake and tremble. And what happens in Khandak? In Khandak, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I'm not going to recite Khandak in detail, that's not my purpose today. But Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he goes to fight Amr ibn Abdawad, he's fighting Amr ibn Abdawad. And he gets to a point where Ali is about to behead Amr ibn Abdawad. He's just about to behead this great warrior of that time. And what does Amr do? He spits on the face of Ali. When he spits on the face of Ali, Ali backs off. He backs off. He gathers himself and he backs off. Why? And Amr bin Abdawad was a bad dude, man. Ali should have finished him off. End the story. Right? We have finished him off, man. There was a chance. You know, this guy was a bad guy and he was a great warrior. Ali ibn Abi Talib should have just killed him off. But Ali ibn Abi Talib is giving us the example of sabr. The example of sabr because Ali ibn Abi Talib is saying to us that if he had killed Amr ibn Abdawad at that time then he would have set a principle for us today. And the principle would have been that you can carry out an action based on emotion and anger. But Ali ibn Abi Talib says, the one who has developed the character of sabr is that person where every action he carries out is only for the pleasure of Allah. So he backs off. It's not the principle that Ali ibn Abi Talib wants to set. This is the importance of sabr. Now, there are various degrees and levels of sabr. And these are indicated in the noble traditions. And we need to examine these different levels of sabr or patience. And the different degrees and the degrees and the different levels. In Al-Kafi, you know, and there is an actual volume which is called Babu Sabr. Right? And in that particular volume, which is the second volume, it's Babu Sabr, you will find this hadith. And this hadith is a beautiful hadith. It is a hadith that is narrated by Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And Amirul Mu'mineen says that the Holy Prophet, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, He says, so Amir al-Mu'minin is saying that the Holy Prophet said that sabr is of three kinds. The first level of sabr is sabr that a person does at the time of affliction. At the time when a misfortune befalls them. The second type of sabr, the second level of sabr is sabr in regard to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to do that, eh? just like in the holy month of Ramadan when you are fasting 18 to 20 hour fast, you are doing sabr with regard to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have to wake up early in the morning for Salatul Fajr in minus 20 degrees and you are in your duvet and you are really quite comfortable, you have to wake up and do wudu, it requires sabr. That is sabr with regard to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the holy prophet says that the third level of sabr is sabr with respect to the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the hardest this is when you are faced with a situation where you would commit an act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you refrain from committing that act that requires sabr when you have to when you could commit a sin and you refrain from committing that sin that requires sabr in regard to the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are levels of sabr in hadith qudsi and hadith qudsi is kalamullah eh? hadith qudsi is hadith from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hadith qudsi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Yabna Adam, not Yabna Muslim 
or yabna des yabna adam is talking to mankind yabna adam all the progeny of adam ana malikun la azul i am that king that never perishes iza kultu li shay'in kun fayakun whenever i say to something be it becomes but then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says yabna adam o the progeny of adam atani fi ma amartuk worship me in the way that i have asked you to worship me not in the way you want to worship him eh? worship me in the way that i have asked you to worship me do sabr in regard to the obedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wantahi amma nahaituk and refrain from all those things that i have forbidden for you do sabr in regard to the disobedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you do that what will happen hatta taqula li shay'in kun fayakun if you do that i will make you such that you will say to something be and it will become look at the capacity of the human being allah is saying i will manifest myself to you you will have qualities that are divine within you i will develop you to such an extent that you will have the power of saying that as to something be and it will become this is the importance of sabr imam jafar sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi he talks about the reward of sabr and he says whomsoever of the believers bears patiently with the tribulations that befall him has the reward of a thousand martyrs a thousand shaheed that is the reward of sabr you know if you read the seerah of the holy prophet you will come across you know the if you look at the history of the holy prophet the seerah of the holy prophet you will come across the incident that there was a thief at the time of the holy prophet and this guy he was a professional thief eh? so he was a professional thief he knew exactly he would plan everything he would know when to strike he was in medina he was a thief and he would see what is the situation in medina which house should i rob how should i do it what's the situation and he his, was a professional one day he heard that a new family had migrated to medina so when he heard this he decided that tonight i am going to go and rob them because whenever a new family would migrate they would come with all their belongings and all their money and all their wealth right they would come with all of that and of course at that time there were no security measures they couldn't go to the bank or anything like that right so at that time everything would be in their homes and they would come with all their belongings and it would be in their homes so this thief decided that tonight i am going to rob them so he plans and when he finishes his planning his planning he goes to that house in the middle of the night and he sees that that house has one room and he saw when he went there he saw that there is a double opportunity tonight because when he went there he realizes that it was not a family that had migrated it was just one young beautiful girl age about 18 years old who had migrated and she had come with bags of gold and silver and they were lying against the wall in that house so he thinks to himself that tonight i'm going to enter this house and i'm going to rob them i'm going to rob this girl and i will also have my illegitimate desires with this woman so he plans and just as he is about to enter the house from the window because that is what thieves do 
just as about his to, he's about to enter the house from the window, he hears somebody reciting the Holy Quran. Now he was an Arab, so he understood Arabic. And he heard somebody reciting the Holy Quran loudly. And this person was reciting Surah Al Naziat, ayat number 79 onwards. For Amma Mantaga, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As for that person who is, who is inordinate and has transgressed all bounds, as for that person who is a sinner and he has transgressed all bounds, الدنيا, and he prefers the life of this world. He prefers the life of this world as opposed to the life of the hereafter. For in al jahima hi al ma'wa. For that person, surely hell is the abode for this person. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa amma man khafa maqama rabbi. And for that person who fears, who is in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he fears that on the day of judgment, when I stand in the presence of my Lord, what will I reply to him? And therefore, he forbids his own soul from the low desires of his own soul. For in al jannata hi al ma'wa. For that person, surely the gardens of heaven are his abode. So he hears this ayah of the Holy Quran. And the ayah of the Holy Quran penetrates his heart. And it has an immediate effect on him in his heart. And he thinks to himself, indeed, if I was to face my Lord, how would I be able to answer my Lord? What answer would I give him? How would I be able to communicate to him? Because I've done so much evil. I have been a robber all my life. And I've been a thief all, all my life. What will happen to me? So he decides that's it. I'm not going to do this. It's time to change. So he leaves. He doesn't enter the house. He leaves. Of course, what he does, he goes to Masjid al-Nabawi because it is time for Fajr Salat. And it's a thief. Eh? So a thief, you know, he has to put on a show banner. You know, the show has to be there. It's like us, you know, when, you know, with thieves, when we steal, you know, when we come to the community, we want to put on a show, right? So you have to be, you know, at least appear to be very pious and very nice. So he goes to Fajr Salat every day. And he recites Fajr Salat behind the Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet gives a sermon. And after the Holy Prophet finishes his sermon, he sits next to the Holy Prophet. Subhanallah. He sits next to the Holy Prophet because the Prophet, after he gave a sermon, he used to sit with his companions, right? He used to chill with the companions, right? And he used to have a chat and he used to have a conversation with the companions and they would chat. So the Prophet is sitting, he's sitting right next to the Prophet. And suddenly there was a commotion. Somebody came running to the Holy Prophet and said, there is an emergency. And the Holy Prophet said, what's the emergency? He said, there is a woman, there is a woman outside and she wants to see you right now. So the Holy Prophet said, no problem, send her in. So this woman... This is the same woman, the same 18-year-old girl who was in that house at night that this thief was going to rob. She comes immediately to see the Holy Prophet. As soon as this guy sees that woman, he says like, you know, OMG, man. Like, my game's up, man. I'm toast. Right? And he thinks to himself, he says, you know, if she recognizes me, like, you know, I'm dead man. And he thinks to himself, he says, all these years, eh, I, you know, stole and I was a thief and nothing happened to me. Today, for the first time, I wanted to perform a good deed, right? I performed a good deed and I did sabr today for the first time and I'm going to get caught. So this woman comes in, he's bowing his head. 
The woman looks around, looks at him. She does not recognize him. And he goes, whew, that was close. That was close, man. So now he's comfortable. He's okay. The woman comes and she says to the holy prophet, she says to the holy prophet, O the messenger of God, last night a thief came to my house. And she says, I am alone. And I have come with lots of money because I came from a tribe. I came from a Kabila a tribe that is Kafir. And my parents, my parents have been killed by them in that tribe. But I converted to become a Muslim and I therefore decided to migrate to Medina. I have now come to Medina with all this wealth from my parents, from my father, but I have no protection. Because last night, as I was in my room, in my house, I heard somebody who I think was a thief who came to try and steal from me. So, O oh messenger of God, I have come to you and ask you for protection. Provide me with protection. So the Holy Prophet looked at her and he said, now remember, this is the seerah of the Holy Prophet. Eh? Remember the time at that time. So the Holy Prophet says to her that it's easy to give you protection. He says to her, why don't you get married? Because if you have a husband, then the husband will be able to provide you with protection. We are talking about that time okay, of the Holy Prophet. Now, of course, you know, the Holy Prophet says, why don't you get married? This would be the best way. Now, you know, she, remember it was the time of the prophet, as I said, right? So it was not like, oh, you know, like Rasulullah, like I got to first, like, you know, talk to him and we got to go out a few times and maybe we should discuss on Facebook. I can poke him and she can poke me and, and we, we can find out what's going on. You know, I need to know if there is a good chemistry, you know, it wasn't like that, right? This is the holy prophet saying, why don't you get married? So she says to the holy prophet, no problem. Why don't you find me somebody? You find me somebody and I will get married to him. What better person to find you a partner than the holy prophet himself? So, she, so as she said to the holy prophet, you find me a partner and I'm ready to get married to him. So the holy prophet started to look around. And people like me, you know, they were sticking their heads up, you know, like pick me, man, you know. And when the holy prophet looked around, he saw this thief sitting next to him. And he said to this thief, he said, why don't you get married to her? Now, this is Rasulullah eh, saying, why don't you get married to her? So the thief does not have like, you know, like, you know, like, yeah, you got to give me some time to think about this. You know, I don't know whether she's educated or not, you know. So, you know, so the thief said, okay, Rasulullah, if you want me to get married to her, if this is what you want, I will get married to her. And the prophet right there and then, he recited the nikah of this woman and that thief. Right there and then. And when he finished reciting the nikah, he says to this thief, that now I want you to take your new wife and take her to, your, to her home. So this thief now, with newly married, goes now with his wife and he goes to the home of his wife. The same home that a few hours ago he was going to rob that home and he was going to have an illegitimate relationship with that same woman. As soon as he enters the house, he falls into sajda. As he falls into sajda, the woman is confused. She's like, who did I marry, man? And said, what's happening to you? Why are you in sajda? And he says to her that you don't realize who I am. The thief that you heard a few hours ago, that was me. I had come to rob you and I had come to have illegitimate relationship with you. But today I I did this sabr from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what I could have got in a haram way just a few hours ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a few hours later gave me those same blessings in a halal way. This is the power of sabr. Amirul Mu'minin says, the one who practices sabr 
will never be deprived of success, even though sometimes it takes a long time. You see, we are the ones who immediately, you know, we want something, we want it immediately. We want it right now. Even though what we want may not be in the best of our interests. But we, you know, sometimes get, you know, we sometimes get disillusioned, right? We ask Allah for something. We do dua to him for something. Oh Allah, please give me this. Please give me that. And when he does not answer our supplications, we get disillusioned. Mana, is he listening or is he not listening? How many namaz shab? How many shall I pray? How many namaz shab? How many amals should I do? He just isn't listen. There is a beautiful hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, he outlines these issues. He says that a delay in your dua should not dishearten you. Imam Ali alayhi salam. A delay in your dua should not dishearten you for surely the grant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is proportional to the sincerity of your intention. And then Imam Ali alayhi salam says, maybe the response has been delayed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he has planned something for you that is even better than what you have asked. That is why he has delayed it. Maybe you have asked for something and it was not given to you because you were granted something even greater than that. And then Imam Ali alayhi salam says, or maybe... And just maybe, eh? look at this, is very important. Imam Ali says that maybe it has been kept away from you because it is for your own good. For many times you ask for things that are detrimental to your faith. See, we believe that we know what is good for us. But I got to tell you, man, we don't. We really don't. You know, we say to Allah, oh Allah, you just give me this. Eh? Give me this now. And I promise, you know, I will become the perfect woman. Just give it to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't dictate to me what is good for you. I created you. I know what is good for you. You have asked me, you have asked me, to get proximity towards me. I will make you such that you will get proximity towards me. Don't dictate to me what you want. If I give you that you know, huge amount of money and you become money bags now, right? Then you will be pumped with that pride and with that takabur inside of you and that will take you away from me. But you said you want to be close to me, did you not? So think of the blessings that I'm going to give you that will develop you so that you become close to me. Sabr, my friends, in obedience, in regard to obedience of Allah, and sabr in regard to the disobedience results in the purification of the heart and the attainment of taqwa and the ability to awaken ourselves. When the temptation of a sin is coming in front of you, then sabr is the thing that purifies that heart, that leads you to perfection. What is also interesting is that once somebody, once a believer has mastered the moral value of sabr and it has become a state in your heart, he will automatically raise himself to the level of shukr, to the level of thankfulness. Because the level of thankfulness is higher than the level of sabr. He raises himself. You see, sometimes we don't realize that, you know, we are trialed not just by calamities, but sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trials us by giving us blessings and bounties. And that is a harder trial for us. And it depends on how we look at it. If we do not consider the blessings and the bounties that Allah gives us 
as a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we do not consider those blessings as a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then when we receive those blessings, we get, you know, we turn into becoming proud. We turn into becoming conceited because we have this thing that I did it. It was me, my efforts. It was I who performed this. There is nobody else. I did this. And this I-ness comes into you when Allah gives you a great position and you don't regard it as a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you immediately go into ujub, which is self-conceit. And you have pride in yourself. But if you consider the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, if you consider those as a trial of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that leads you to humbleness and it leads you to shukr. It's the consequence of that. The consequence of sabr now, now you take that particular blessing that Allah gives you and you utilize that blessing the way Allah wants you to utilize that blessing. That's how he tests you. That's how he shows you that you can develop. It's very important, my friends, to understand these moral dimensions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done. Amongst the Ahlul Bayt, they have taught us how to raise this relationship of sabr and shukr even further. When the believer does sabr in calamities and shukr in the bounties provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Ahlul Bayt do something more exalted than this. Once, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. He was traveling. And he came across a traveler. Eh? And Imam alayhi salam asked the traveler to introduce himself. The traveler did not know that this was Imam Ali. So the person replied to Imam Ali, you know, he was trying to be smart, you know, so he said to Imam Ali, he said, I'm a Muslim. So Imam Ali looked at him and he said, is that right? He said, tell me, why do you say that you are a Muslim? And this man replied, he said, I'm a Muslim. He says, because when I ask Allah for something and he does not give it to me, I do sabr. And when I ask Allah for something and he gives it to me, I do shukr. That's not bad, man. That's pretty good, right? That's not bad. Oh, that's all right. And Imam Ali, when he heard this, he smiled at him. And he said, this is the difference between you and the Ahlul Bayt. Because when we ask Allah, we the Ahlul Bayt, when we ask Allah for something and he does not give it to us, we do shukr. And when we ask Allah for something, and if he gives it to us, we give it away in charity. That's the difference. This is how you raise yourself, my friends. In Nahjul Balaga, if you read Sermon 155, you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he alludes to this conversation that he has with the Holy Prophet. You see, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, becomes very upset at one point because he did not taste martyrdom. Imam Ali, after the battle of Uhud, especially, the Holy Prophet had said to Imam Ali that you will become shaheed, that you will become a martyr. And after the battle of Uhud, Imam Ali was still alive. He had not tasted martyrdom. So he became upset. And one day then, Imam Ali salam and the Holy Prophet were sitting together and they were talking with each other. And the Holy Prophet looked at Imam Ali and he said to Imam Ali, Oh Abu Hassan, after my death, my Ummah will not be good to you. And then the Holy Prophet said, You will have to face many calamities and you will have to face a lot of oppression from my Ummah. And then the Holy Prophet said, Oh Ali, there will come a day 
when you will be martyred in the position of sajda. And at this time, tears were flowing on the cheeks of Rasulullah. But then the Holy Prophet said to Imam Ali alayhi salam, O Abu Hassan, when you face these calamities and this oppression, tell me, what will your sabr be like? What a question. Eh? What a question. The Holy Prophet says to Imam Ali, O Ali, when you face these calamities, tell me, what will your sabr be like? And, the, and, and Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at the Holy Prophet and he says to the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, may my mother and my father be sacrificed for you, O the Holy Prophet. I just have one question. What is it, Ali? And Imam Ali said, tell me, O, o Holy Prophet, that when that time comes, when your ummah is oppressive towards me and I have all these calamities, will I be on the path of truth or not? And the Holy Prophet says to Imam Ali, of course you will be on the part of, thru, uh, of truth, O Ali. Then Imam Ali alayhi salam smiles and he says to the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, if I am going to be on the path of truth at that time, then that time will not be a time of sabr for me. That time will be a time of shukr for me. <coughs> Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is the lesson that we have to take. A noble characteristic like sabr can either lead us to conceit or pride, or it can lead us to humbleness or shukr and thankfulness. And this is the lesson we learn from Lady Zainab in Karbala. You, I, this is my challenge. You Google whatever you want and you look at any book of maktal that you want, you will never find in the history of Karbala or in the history anywhere else, you will never find that Bibi Zainab suffered and she blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. You will never find it. There is nowhere that you will find any historian saying that after all the calamities that Janab Zainab faced, that at any time she blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Why? Because she had patience. She was that person who at every moment in Karbala, at every moment in Karbala, not only was she at the peak of sabr, not only was she at the mi'raj of sabr, she was at the peak of shukr and thankfulness. To the extent when her two children, when the bodies of her two children are brought to the tent, she is in the state of sajda and she is saying, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept my sacrifice. Meraj sabar ko agar aapko dekhna ho, meraj sabar ka agar andaza aapko lagana ho, to aapko kahi dekhne ki zarurat nahi. Aap sirf janab Zainab alayhi salam ka ki zindagi ka mutaliyah farmaye. Or aapko pata chalega ki ye wo Zainab hai, ki har marhale pe sabr ki mi'raj ki manzil pe hai aur shukr ki mi'raj ki manzil pe hai jab ye loota hua kafila karbala se kufa ja raha tha to ahl e haram ko in laino ne ahl e haram ko shuhada ki jo laashe thi maktal mein usse kareeb ja ke unse guzara gaya जब जनाब जैनब ने एक मर्तबा देखा लाशों को तो एक मर्तबा जनाब जैनब ने सकीना के सामने देखा देखा कि ये बच्ची एक मर्तबा अपने बाबा के लाश को देख रही है ये वो ऐसा इसी लाश है जिस लाश पे ना कफन है और जिस लाश पे ना सर है 
کیا کیفیت ہو گئی ہوگی اس 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 وقت جناب سکینہ کی ازادارو جب یہ اہل حرم وہاں سے گزرے ہے تو ایک مرتبہ اہل حرم وہاں رک گئے اور بی بیوں نے گریا شروع کرنا کر دیا بی بیوں نے ماتم شروع کرنا کر دیا ایک مرتبہ جب بی بیوں نے ماتم کیا ہے تو عمر ساد شمر کے پاس آتا ہے عمر ساد نے شمر کو کہا شمر میں دیکھ رہا ہوں کہ یہ بی بیا ماتم کر رہی ہے یہ بی بیا رو رہی ہے یہ بی بیا گریا کر رہی ہے میں چاہتا ہوں کہ یہ ماتم کو تو بند کر دے ایک مرتبہ شمر آگے بڑھا اپنے تازیانے کو نکالا اور جناب امام سجاد کی پشت پر شمر نے تازیانے کا وار کیا جب جناب سجاد کی پشت پر شمر کے تازیانے لگے ہیں ایک مرتبہ سجاد نے امام حسین کے سر کی طرف دیکھا اور کہا بابا جب تک سجاد کی جان میں جان ہے سجاد برداشت کرے گا لیکن اہل حرم کو یہ نہیں کہے گا کہ یہ ماتم بند کر دے یا یہ گریا بند کر دے ازادارو عمر ابن سعد شمر کے پاس آتا ہے شمر کو کہتا ہے شمر شمر میں نے دیکھا کہ ابھی بھی ماتم بند نہیں ہو رہا ہے اب شمر کہتا ہے عمر سعد کو عمر ابن سعد میں ابھی ماتم بند کروا دیتا ہوں ابھی ماتم کو روک لیتا ہوں ازادارو شمر آگے بڑھتا ہے سیدانیوں کو اکٹھا کیا سب سیدانیوں کے ہاتھ پسے بر گردن باندھ دیے گئے تاکہ اب آپ دلہ کے ماتم کو روکا جائے ازاداران حسین یہ اس تاریخ میں ملتا ہے کہ تین ایسی جگہیں تھی تین ایسے وقت تھے جہاں ہمارے اماموں نے زار زار رونا شروع کیا ہے امام امام ہمارے امام کے دل سے چیخ نکلی ہے پہلا وقت وہ ہے جب امیر المؤمنین جناب فاطمہ الزہرا کو غسل دے رہے تھے مورخ لکھتے ہیں کہ ایک ایسا وقت آتا ہے کہ امیر المؤمنین غسل دے رہے ہیں اور امیر المؤمنین زار زار رونے لگے اور چیخنے لگے جب کسی نے پھر پوچھا امیر المؤمنین کو کہ کیا بات ہے ہم نے علی کو کبھی ایسے روتے ہوئے نہیں دیکھا ہے تو امیر المؤمنین نے کہا کہ جب میں فاطمہ الزہرا کو غسل دے رہا تھا تب میری نظر فاطمہ الزہرا کے اس جسم پہ پری جہاں میں نے دیکھا کہ دروازہ جب فاطمہ فاطمہ الزہرا پہ گرا تھا اور فاطمہ الزہرا زخم ہو گئی تھی امیر المؤمنین کہتے ہیں کہ فاطمہ الزہرا نے مجھے یہ کبھی نہیں بتایا کہ وہ کتنی زخمی ہوئی تھی جب میں نے یہ منظر دیکھا مجھ سے برداشت نہیں ہوا دوسری دفعہ جب ہمارے امام زار زار روئے ہیں وہ ہمارے چوتھے امام امام سجاد ہے وہ زندان شام تھا زندان شام میں جب جناب رکیہ کا انتقال ہوا ہے تو ایک مرتبہ شام کی بی بیا آئی شام کی بی بیا غسل دینے کے لیے آئی جب غسل دینے کے لیے آئی تو ایک مرتبہ شام کی بی بیا نے غسل نہیں دیا امام سجاد کے پاس آئی کہتی ہے ابن رسول اللہ ہم یہ بچی کو غسل نہیں دے سکتے امام سجاد نے کہا تم کیوں غسل نہیں دے سکتے شام کی بی بیا نے کہا کہ ہم نے جب غسل ہم نے جب غسل دینا شروع کیا تو ہم نے دیکھا کہ اس بچی کے جسم میں اتنے داغ ہے ہم گھبرا رہے ہیں کہ اس بچی کو ایسی کوئی بیماری تھی جس کی وجہ سے پورا جسم داغ سے بھرا ہوا ہے ہم نہیں چاہتے کہ یہ بیماری ہمیں لگ جائے جب امام سجاد نے یہ سنا تو امام زار زار رونے لگے امام چیخنے لگے امام نے ان بیبیوں سے کہا کہ دیکھو یہ میری بہن کے جسم میں یہ کوئی بیماری کے داغ نہیں ہے یہ میری بہن کی جسم پہ یہ وہ داغ ہے جو شمر کے تماچے کی وجہ سے لگے ہیں یہ وہ داغ ہے کہ جب سکینہ اونٹ پہ تھی تو بار بار زمین پہ گرتی تھی ازاداروں تیسرا میرا امام جو زار زار رویا ہے وہ امام محمد باقر ہے امام محمد محمد باقیر کہتے ہیں کہ ایک وقت آیا جب میرے بابا کا انتقال ہوا اور جب میں میرے بابا کو 
غسل دینے کے لیے گیا ہوں امام باقر غسل جب دینے کے لیے گئے اور شروع کیا غسل دینا تو ایک مرتبہ امام باقر رک گئے اور زار زار رونے لگے اور چیخنے لگے کسی نے پوچھا امام باقر کو کہ آپ کیوں اتنا رو رہے ہیں امام باقر نے کہا کہ جب میں نے غسل دینا شروع کیا تو میں نے میرے بابا کے پشت پہ شمر کے تازی آنے کے وہ زخم دیکھے ہیں اور مجھے ایسا لگا کہ اتنے سالوں کے بعد بھی یہ زخم ابھی بھی تازے ہے <تصفح> 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 